Good morning. How we doing? Mediocre, it sounds. <laughs> Mediocre to poor, it sounds. And we'll see what we can do about that. So we are uh, Merry Christmas. Also, I never say Merry Christmas from the stage. I don't know why I struggle with that. So Merry Christmas. Um, we are awaiting Advent together, uh, and awaiting Advent is hard. Uh, I, I know some people have tripped over the wording because you're like, oh, why are we awaiting Advent? We're already in Advent. Totally get it. Totally makes sense. Maybe seems redundant. Uh, part of being a follower of Jesus is that we are looking forward to the second coming, the second Advent of Christ. And one of the ways we do that is by taking this season and looking back at Christ's first coming, his first Advent. So December kind of functions historically in the church calendar as this hinge month of looking back and looking forward. Charles Dickens really had it right with ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. We're, we're kind of all wrapped up in looking back and looking forward. And so this week, we're awaiting God's presence. And there is nothing harder for anybody than waiting. Waiting is hard. We have entire rooms designed just for waiting. They're called waiting rooms. And they are purgatory. They're awful. I don't believe theologically in purgatory, but if there was, it would be a waiting room. You walk in and inevitably, because if it's a doctor's office, it's going to have a massive, heavy door that's going to make all kinds of noise when you walk in to this quiet, sanctified space of waiting. It's going to make a loud noise and everyone will look at you as if you've disturbed their 1,000 year slumber. They will resent you for it. You'll shuffle shamefully to the receptionist Tell them you're there. You'll mumble while you're there. They'll ask for your driver's license and insurance, which hasn't changed in the five years since you've been to that doctor. You'll sit down, equidistant from everybody else in the waiting area, because you don't want to get what they got. You're just there for a checkup. And then the door will open again, and you will glare, just like the other people did to you. You will glare at that person. How dare you? And then somebody that arrived after you will be taken back before you, and you will resent them as if they kicked a puppy. It's true. Waiting is awful. Waiting rooms are terrible. We don't like to wait. They're discomforting places. Waiting rooms aren't comfortable, despite what they do with chairs and TVs and all that. It's not a comfortable place to be. It's a place of discomfort, and we long to be comfortable. We want to be comforted. I feel, during this time of year, you begin to take stock of all the things that you're waiting for, the things you're waiting for God to do in your life. Maybe find a new job, maybe get a spouse, maybe have kids. Constantly waiting. Maybe you're waiting for God to do something to save a child of yours. Maybe you're waiting for God to save your marriage. Maybe you're waiting for God to do, and that can be even more discomforting, waiting for God to act. And so today I want us to talk about how we can find comfort in the midst of waiting, how we can use comfort to drive us into the presence of God rather than letting it be something that distracts us. So we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 7, verses 10 through 17, and we're going to see how we can reject, seek, and remain. Reject temporary comfort. Let's reject temporary comfort. Verse 10 of chapter 7, book of Isaiah. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Okay, Ahaz is a king. He's the king of Judah. And if you're not familiar with Israel's history, uh, they were unified, 12 tribes, unified, King Saul, King David, King Solomon, kingdom splits. 10 tribes go north, not physically, like they just secede essentially, and two tribes say in the southern kingdom of Judah. So there's Israel in the north, Judah in the south, Ahaz is the king of Judah. So he is one of the direct descendants of David. So again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz through Isaiah, ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be as deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. Verse 13, and he said, hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Parents, use that with your kids. Is it too little that you weary men, you weary my God also? That'll put them in their place. They'll just look at you really confused. So Ahaz is a pretty terrible king. He does a lot of terrible things. One of the worst things he does is he offers his children as sacrifices outside the city to a god, probably the god Molech. That's pretty high on the list of crimes in Israel's day. 
He's so bad, in fact, that they have, they have handed over, God has handed over Judah uh, to be conquered by their enemies. So Syria, Assyria, Israel, Edom, all of them beat up on Judah at this point. They're like the cowboys under Dave Campo. They just cannot win, and everybody beats them up real bad. And so Israel and Syria, okay, don't get confused. There's Syria and Assyria. Israel and Syria are two minor kingdoms with Judah, and then Assyria is the big bad. They're the big empire to the north. So Israel and Syria get together, and they're like, hey, let's form a pact, an alliance against Assyria. Judah, do you want to join? And Judah's like, no, we're good. We're going to sit this one out. Well, Israel and Syria don't want to fight a war on two fronts, Judah to the south, Assyria to the north. And so they say, well, let's beat up on Judah first. So it's like pro wrestling with kings and kingdoms instead of steroids and baby oil, okay? Everybody's going after each other, and Judah is currently being attacked, and they decide, Ahaz decides, I am going to write to Assyria, I'm gonna send a messenger to the empire of Assyria, and they're gonna come and help me. They're gonna come and help me. And Assyria is a hardcore, evil, evil empire. In the Bible, Babylon and Egypt are, are typically held up as the evil, like if you're a bad kingdom, you're, you're likened to Babylon or you're likened to Egypt. Babylon and Egypt are like, hey, we're bad, but we're not Assyria bad. Assyria would disable people and then let them just wander in the wilderness until they died. That was one of their punishments. They would flay people and hang their skin from the walls. They would impale people on large metal, or, or sorry, not metal, wooden uh, stakes outside their cities. So much so that Vlad the Impaler, hundreds of years later, read about what the Assyrians did and was like, hey, I need a new name. That sounds like a good idea. The guy who's known for impaling people got it from the Assyrians. That's how evil they were. And God says through Isaiah, look, do not turn to them. You don't need to, they're not going to deliver you from Israel and from Syria. Look to me, you can trust in me. And he says, to validate this, you can ask for any kind of a sign and I'll do it. Now, what's going on here? When a prophet made a prophecy in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, we'll get there in a second, they would make a prophecy about something that was gonna happen in the either distant future or not too distant future, but it wasn't gonna happen right then. And to validate that sign, they would have to uh, uh, make some kind of a sign happen in the short term, okay? So Moses shows up to Egypt, shows up to Pharaoh and says, hey, God says to let my people go and to prove that I'm from God, here's my stick on the ground, it turns into a snake. Jesus shows up, I'm the son of God, I'm the Messiah, and to prove it, Look, this person that couldn't walk before, he can walk. Look, this person's got full of demons, now he's not. Those are signs pointing to the fact that they are legitimately from God. And so what Isaiah is saying here is God says, hey, you can ask for any kind of sign you want to prove that God is going to deliver you from Israel, from Syria, and from Assyria. All you gotta do is ask. Wow, wow. Imagine something you're waiting for right now. Imagine something you want God to do in your life. And imagine somebody comes to you and says, hey, God's gonna do it for you. And to prove it, you can ask for any sign you want. You could ask for cows to bark like dogs. You could ask for Michael Bay to make an Oscar-worthy movie. You could ask for Joe Biden and Donald Trump to form a BFF book tour. <laughs> and God would do it to prove to you that he would do what he said he's gonna do. So we talked about Ahaz being an evil king. We've talked about this sign that God, why would God present a blank check like this to one of the most evil kings in Judah's history? Why? If you don't hear anything else today, I want you to hear this. Here's why. Because God loves him. And because God is offering him the opportunity to turn from his evil and to put his trust in him because God hasn't given up on him. And I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what things you think are in your life that keep you from a relationship with the Lord. I can almost guarantee you that you haven't sacrificed your child to a foreign God. If God is willing to turn to somebody and call them to himself and say, hey, I know you've done evil, but I still love you and you can still turn to me, that offer is still open to you as well. You don't have to keep going down the road that you're going. You don't have to turn to the Assyrias of your life you can repent. You can turn to the Lord. We're gonna talk about how you can do that today. 
But in the meantime, our boy uh, Ahaz here tries to get cute. And he's like, oh, I'm not gonna put the Lord my God to the test, which sounds super religious. It sounds super faithful, but it actually betrays him because he shows that he doesn't have the faith to trust in a sign from God. Now, why does he do this? Again, notice uh, what Isaiah says. Isaiah says, you weary my God. He doesn't weary our God. So this is a subtle way of being like, God is, you've pushed God too far. You and your whole family have pushed God too far. So why does Ahaz do this? Why does he not turn to the Lord with this blank check sign that God is giving him? And here's why. He's already made up his mind. He's already made up his mind that he wants the presence of Assyria, the tangible, dependable, he thinks, presence of Assyria to save the day rather than turning to what seems to be a guarantee from the Lord. He doesn't want the presence of God in his life. He's determined not to alter his course. It's all about presence. He wants the presence of tangible Assyria rather than a spiritual promise from God. That's what it is. And it's tempting for us to look at Ahaz here and be like, wow, what an idiot. But we do this all the time. It's why we get wrapped up in gifts in Christmas time. No pun intended. But it's why it's so hard to focus on Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior during this season rather than to think about that big box under the tree that's from my family. I have no idea what it is. It's eating me up. I don't know what it is. No, this is really true. I don't know what it is. But it's why we get focused on the gifts, because they're tangible. They're real. They're tangible things that people love us. And then there's this baby in the manger here that we're not quite sure what to do with. We're not quite sure how to process it. How many times when you've been faced with the decision, you've needed God's guidance in your life and said, yeah, I'll pray about it, and then you didn't pray about it? Or better yet, you, you looked at it and you treated it kind of like this thing, well, God, I'm gonna go through with this. I'm gonna do this thing that may or may not be right. And if you wanna stop me, you're gonna have to stop me. I'm gonna look for like an invitation to, to Trump and Biden's BFF book club. And that's what, that way I'll know that I need to stop doing what I'm doing. We have a hard time seeking the comfort and presence of God over and against the tangible things that offer so much comfort. And usually this manifests itself in two places. One, it manifests itself when there's something that we know God doesn't want us to do, but we wanna do it and we're gonna go forward with it anyway. Typically this looks like addictions. And if you're struggling with addiction, hey, the sinner is a great place. It's coming up on a new year. Why struggle with it any longer? Go talk to somebody about it. But addictions are things where you can start to kind of uh, uh, do a downward spiral, right? And before you know it, when you're crying out for help, you, it's already too late. You've already committed to a course of action. It's too late to pull out. This happens with alcohol a lot, right? We want God to help us, but yet we still keep alcohol around because we're like, well, if God was really gonna cure me, I would be able to have it around. Or you're addicted to pornography and you refuse to let anybody like step in and kind of monitor what you're, what you're looking at on the internet. Dude, Google already does that. You might as well let somebody who's a good friend of yours do it too. The other place that it shows up is when we're not sure what, we want, what God wants us to do, but we get impatient. We get impatient. We don't want to wait on God to tell us what to do. We're like, I don't wanna miss this opportunity, so I'm just gonna go for it. And God, if you wanna stop me, Michael Bay needs to make Transformers 8 and Megatron needs to get a Best Actor, nom actor nomination. That's, what, that's how we, we do things with the Lord. We get impatient. We don't wait because we don't like waiting. And at the end of the day, here's the problem. When we make decisions, we funnel everything basically through a boardroom that we have in our mind. And seated around this table where we are the CEO of said company that is our life, seated around this boardroom, we have different people who speak into it. We have self-help. We have our news agencies. We have our doctors, we have legal stuff to think through. We've got our financial advisor, we've got a career advisor. And over here in the corner, functioning basically as chaplain over the whole thing, is Jesus Christ. And we're like, Jesus, thank you for opening us up in prayer. Now, if you could just be quiet for a while, let the big boys handle the rest of the decisions. Jesus does not want an invitation to the boardroom that runs your life. He wants you to fire everybody and let him run the whole company. And there's no, there's no like partials with this. There's no, well, I'm gonna keep some of them on. No, 
Jesus wants to be CEO of your life, and here's why. He's better at it than you are, and he died for you. Those are the two reasons. I don't care who you work for. I don't care how good of a boss they are. I don't care how great your CEO is. They're probably not gonna die for you. Jesus did, and he wants to run your life. But our problem is we do not want the seemingly intangible presence of God in our life. What we want is something physical, something we can hold on to. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to get in the practice. It's a discipline. It's not, I don't want to say it's not natural, but, it, but it's really not. For us to turn the decision-making process of our life over to God. Because if you're an adult, you've been doing this for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, you're kind of set in your ways of making decisions. So here's what I want you to do. I did this this week, okay? And I say I did it this week. I started on Tuesday, okay? But I did it for most of the week. All of us, most of us, are capable of choosing what we want to eat, right? I feel like this, I'm gonna go eat it. I feel like this, but I probably shouldn't have Chick-fil-A for the ninth time, so I'm probably gonna not. I want you to give the Lord your meals for a week and say, Lord, what do you want me to eat today? Lord, what do you want me to have for this meal? What do you want us to have for this meal? So here's how it worked out in my life this week. One morning, I have like three things that I basically eat for breakfast, like then they're on a rotation. And if I cycle through them, I'm like, okay, time to start all over again. I'm a simple man with simple tastes. And so I was brushing my teeth one morning, I think it was Wednesday, and I was like, Lord, what do you want me to eat today? What do you want for, what are we eating for breakfast? And I went through my three things. And again, I know this sounds strange. This is not normally how I do things. But I honestly didn't feel like the Lord was like, yeah, you should have those. You should have that. So I was like, well, Lord, should I not eat anything? And honestly, a peace kind of came over me. I was like, all right, we're fasting for breakfast today. And I went on with my day. The other way it looked like was I kind of relinquished control of my diet to other people. So I eat some lunches this week with some folks, and they were like, hey, what do you want to eat? And I was like, no, don't you pick? And they picked things that I would not go to. Thai food. What? I don't do that. <laughs> I had Thai food twice this week. <laughs> but what it's done is it's a good discipline for me because now what I'm realizing in my life is I'm now turning bigger decisions over to the Lord. It gets you in the practice if you are willing to admit that you can't even make your own choices for meals, you can admit some other things too. So try it. Try it this week. Try it with your family. And if you get to the point where you're like, I don't know if God's leading me to do something or that, just say, Lord, sanctify my, sanctify my, my diet. I'm going to go out to Chick-fil-A for the ninth time. Whatever. Maybe not the ninth time. Maybe avoid that. So if we reject those things, if we reject the tangible things, we need to seek after God's comfort. Go back to verse 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay, so there's two things going on here. And because we live uh, following uh, the birth of Christ, we know that the two things going on here. There's a prophecy that's gonna be fulfilled uh, sometime in Ahaz's life. And then there's a greater prophecy. This is called escalation. That's gonna be greater than, right? So this week I was kind of tripped up because I was like, were there two virgins bir vir vir virgin births? Were there one in Ahaz's time and then one in Jesus' time? And the answer is no. It's an escalation of prophecy. So let me tell you what's going on. All right, so there is a woman in Ahaz's day. Now, there's a lot of debate as to who she is because not a lot is known about her. For me, because she is supposed to be assigned to Ahaz, I'm gonna operate under the assumption that Ahaz knows who she is. Ahaz is gonna be close to her. Ahaz is gonna see her on a regular basis. This could be a wife of his. This could be a concubine. This might be a daughter of his. But when the prophecy is made, she is unmarried, she is a virgin, and she is going to get married, and she is going to have a baby, and that baby is going to be named by her, Emmanuel, which means God with us, okay? And so there's two things that are going on here. This is two ways that this is assigned to Ahaz. One, typically men name the babies in the ancient world. And so this woman is going to be the one who insists on the baby being named Emmanuel, now, this could be a whole host of reasons why this is the case. Me, personally, I think the Lord is subtly telling Ahaz, hey, the father of this baby is gonna have as much to do naming this kid as you are delivering your country from Assyria, from Syria, and from Israel. The second way that it functions as a sign is what do they name the child? Emmanuel, which means what? God with us, or God is with us. This woman... Now, I've never been pregnant, obviously, but I know a little bit about it, 
And I know that when it's time to have the baby, it's time to have the baby. You can't be like, honey, this is a really great part of the movie. Hold on one second. When it's go time, it's go time. And this is problematic, especially in the ancient world, because if, there's, if your city is under siege, if you're under attack by a foreign kingdom, you can't be like, time out on the war, my wife's having a baby. She just goes into labor. So this woman goes into labor in the middle of a battle, in the middle of their country under siege from Syria and Israel, and God brings her through it. And she has more faith than the king of, a of Judah by saying, God did this. God delivered me. God rescued me. God is with us. Emmanuel. Ahaz refused to believe it, but this unnamed woman believes. She has great faith. And we know this points us to a greater sign. A greater sign. Another virgin who stays a virgin until she has Jesus. Right? She has other sons and daughters through uh, Joseph. She has Jesus. And Jesus is fully man, born of a woman, but also fully God. Now, why? Why is he fully man and fully God? Why does it have to be God with us? Because we are all under siege. But it's not some foreign kingdom. It is sin. It is darkness. It is brokenness. It is evil. And all of our lives are, are under siege by them. It's why we can't get away from it. It's why we can't stop doing some of the things we want to stop doing. It's why we can't be the good people that we want to be because we're under siege. We're at war. And Jesus, the son of God, puts on flesh and instead of standing outside the walls of our city, our besieged life and being like, hope you guys figure it out. No, he enters into the besieged kingdom. He enters into our lives as a man. And he says, I'm gonna rescue you. And because he's God, he can. Rather than us dying in the battle, he dies for us. And your way out, your way out of the fight, your way out of, of the siege, to break the siege, is you put your faith and your trust in him. You say, Lord Jesus, I'm gonna do what Ahaz couldn't do. I'm gonna put my faith in the sign that you gave. Not just a sign of a baby in a manger, but the sign of a man on a cross saying, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing and it's finished. I want it to be finished. Jesus is nicknamed, one of his names is Emmanuel, God with us. And we think that that means that, oh, okay, the son of God put on flesh and he dwelt among us for 30 years, which is true, but it's only partially true. Because Jesus tells us at the end of his life, I will be with you until the end of the age. I will never leave you or forsake you. And then he like pieces out to heaven. It's like one of the last things he says. He's like, I'm never gonna leave you. Bye. I'm like, what is that? Well, when you come to accept Christ, you have the Holy Spirit come and live inside of you. Emmanuel isn't just with you today. Or sorry, he wasn't just with you uh, with, uh, during Jesus' day. He's with you now. He's with you today. And he'll be with you again when Christ returns. Emmanuel is an ongoing promise. And in John 14, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit a paraclete. This is a word we need to get back in, we need to get, get in the English language. It was never in the English language. It's a Greek word. It can mean all sorts of things, encourager, exhorter, helper, mediator, comforter. Like if you wanna be a good spouse or a good friend, be a paraclete. That's what you wanna be, okay? But the word I wanna focus on is comforter because God gave us the spirit to comfort us. We're all uncomfortable. All of us are uncomfortable this time of year. I think we get nostalgic this time of year. You think back about Christmases in your past that were better and maybe they really weren't, but they seem better because maybe everybody was home and so the house was full or maybe the kids were little and so there was just a lot of joy in life. We're kind of in that season right now and it's really fun. It doesn't matter how lame Christmas is. The kids are happy, so everything's kind of working. Or maybe there's a loved one that this is the first Christmas that they're not gonna be there. Either the Lord took them or they left. And so there's something about all the lights that make the shadows lengthen a little bit. We get uncomfortable. And during this season, you can do one of two things. You can be like Ahaz, and you can turn to the tangible comforts in your life. So you can turn to food, busy schedules, alcohol, 19,000 Hallmark Christmas movies that all end the same way, <laughs> Netflix, and you can say it was gifts, and you can say it was a good Christmas. And you can be like Ahaz, the tangible things. Or you can be like an unnamed woman 
in Isaiah chapter 7, or you can be like a named woman in Luke chapter 1, named Mary, who when they were in the midst of the discomfort of being pregnant, one during a war, one during being an unmarried woman in the ancient world, and when they needed comfort, they turned to the Lord. Let these two women lead you into the comfort and the comforting arms of God, into his presence, because that's what they sought out. They didn't have Netflix. They didn't have uh, a Hallmark. They didn't have a whole lot to eat. And Mary, look what she says, and here's what I wanna do. Last service, we read this together. I don't think that's a good idea today. I think, I'm just gonna read this over you. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think about the thing that makes you uncomfortable. Maybe it's closing your eyes in a large group of people, whatever it is. Luke chapter one, verse 46, and Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed for he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in their thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. You can open your eyes now. That is called the Magnificat. And that is Mary's song to the Lord, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Seeking comfort. And as you are needing to seek comfort from God, I would encourage you, turn to the Magnificat. Turn again and again to it. Seek comfort in the Lord's arms, in his presence. Now, last thing. The hard part is not just doing it once, but remaining. Remaining faithful despite discomfort. Verse 15. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim, that's the northern ten tribes, departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. So what's going on? If this woman is a member of the royal household and she gives birth to a child, that child will be a member of the royal household, which means you would eat well, Right? Well, we read this and we think, oh, curds and honey, that means like milk and honey or good thing, like curds and whey, like Little Miss Muffet. No, what that means is uh, curds and honey were poor people food. This is like saying they will eat ramen and Taco Bell, okay? Some of you are like, man, I like Taco Bell, back up off. I like Taco Bell too, you're in good company. What he's saying is Assyria is going to come and destroy Israel and destroy uh, Syria before the boy's old enough to be a man. So probably in less than 13 years, which is true. Syria is destroyed in three years. Israel's destroyed in 10 years. But the problem is Ahaz has sought an Assyrian rescue, and that's exactly what he gets. A destructive, d- a destroying, bloodthirsty deliverer. Whatever you seek to save you, that's what your life will look like. There's a great Christmas movie called Die Hard. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. The reason why John McClane rescues everybody with a gun is because he's a cop, right? And he's the tough guy. Like, that's the image he has. And so the movie takes shape. If, if you put Buddy the Elf in Die Hard to rescue everybody, I guarantee you he's not using a gun. He's using something sugary. Okay? <laughs> Somebody's going to make a movie about that now. You're welcome. I demand a credit. Your life will look like the rescuer that you asked to come and help you. So if your job's gonna bail you out, your life will be consumed by your job. If your family's gonna bail you out, guess what? Your family's gonna be the most important thing to you and the culture of your life will take on that same thing. If Jesus Christ is gonna be your deliverer, your life will look like him. You can't get away from it. You can't get away from it. We just have to be patient. We have to be patient and let him do things. That's the hardest part about trusting in the Lord is waiting for him to act, to be patient. We live in an era where like you can have anything delivered to your door like right away unless there's supply chain issues. It's amazing, but it makes us an impatient people. So here's what I want you to do to cultivate this idea of remaining in a regular pattern of trusting in the Lord. I got three things for you that I think you can practice. One, do the Advent guide. Now I'm gonna have a moment of confession with you. We were kind of short on print and I am a little bit of a Luddite. I don't like technology 
And so I wanted a paper copy. And at the end of every single week, past two weeks, I've given my paper copy away because there was some poor soul that needed it. But that meant that I did not do the Advent guide. So you might be sitting there yourself and say, you know what, Travis, I wanna do the guide, but we're already halfway through it. Well, guess what? I'm starting today too. You can be in remedial Advent with me <laughs> and we'll do it together, okay? Do the guide, start today. Have a copy, I'm not giving you mine. Not today. The other thing is take five minutes every day and sit in silence and it will be the worst five minutes of your life every day. Here's what'll happen. Two things will happen in the five minutes that you sit there. The first one is you will think of all the things you could and should be doing with that five minutes. The second thing is you'll think about some of the things that scare you and worry you. And those are the two things you should pray about. The things you're worried about and the things that you try to use to keep busy. And that leads us to the third thing I want you to do. Follow your cravings. You're like, awesome, that's the best advice ever. Your cravings will tell you what it is that you're trying to hide from. Why are you eating so much? Why are you drinking so much? Why are you watching so much TV? Why are you sleeping so much? When do you want to do those things? They will point you to some of the things that you're afraid of, some of the things you're worried about. And again, things that you can run to the Lord in his presence. So maybe it leads to fasting. Maybe it leads to uh, having a dry month for the rest of Christmas. Maybe it leads to celibacy for a month. Maybe it leads to going to bed a little earlier and waking up a little earlier so that you can be in prayer. However it works for you, we have got to reject the tangible comforts, particularly that this, this season offers in front of us. And it's hard to wait, it's discomforting, I know that. But we've gotta seek the presence and the comfort of the Lord because it will be better than anything else you can find. And then you gotta do it again the next day and the next day and the next day. And that is following Jesus. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we look to you to deliver us from the things that we've put ourselves in. Either the addictions or maybe the things that were done to us, Lord. Maybe there's patterns in our life that are there because we were abused or we weren't taught any differently. And now we're middle-aged and we don't know how we got here, but we're here and we need deliverance. Lord Jesus, we invite you into the walls of our city that's crumbling down and pray that you would deliver us from our enemies. Pray that you'd watch over us. We thank you, Lord, that you laid your life down for us. It's in your great name we pray, amen.